Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Wayne Mullins about leadership and the connection with company culture. Wayne Mullins, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'm excited to have a chance to chat with you today. We're going to be focusing on a passion of mine, and that is leadership and the connection of of effective and impactful leadership to company culture, how leadership affects the culture, but also how the culture and the dynamic of the team impacts styles of leadership and how we could be most effective with our people. And I think it's a kind of a reciprocal thing. It, it, it goes both ways and, and it both tend to influence the other. Um, so we'll have a really great conversation around that. As we get started, I wanted to share Wayne's bio with everybody. Wayne Mullins is the founder and CEO of Ugly Mug Marketing. Over the past 20 years, he has scaled multiple companies and helped hundreds of entrepreneurs do the same with their companies. Ugly Mug Marketing has won the praises of some of the leading influencers in the business world, such as Chris Voss, Neil Patel, and Ari Weinswig. Wayne's work directly influences more than 100,000 entrepreneurs annually through his blog, books, and training programs. Wayne has personally worked with clients in over 100 industries from every corner of the globe. And through his books and training programs, Wayne directly influences more than a quarter of a million entrepreneurs each year. Again, wonderful uh, to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Anything else you would like to share by way of background or personal context before we really dive on in? Yeah, um, I think I'd start with just saying that, uh, first of all, I'm excited about this conversation. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Um, Over the last, you know, probably four years or so, um, kind of building a team, building a culture has been a point of intention for me. Um, And the story goes like this. Um, So I've got a a small company. I have some friends who have some smaller companies. And I had a friend who was at the point of deciding to either scale his company or sell his company. And I was a part of an entrepreneurial mastermind. And it just so happens that we did lunch once a month. And so I said to my friend, I said, this is the perfect opportunity for you to come. Um, It will give you a chance to kind of be around some other entrepreneurs who have scaled their companies to ask questions and kind of learn from them. So we show up to lunch. I'm excited that he's there, introduce him to several people. And then every single time we met, there was a topic of conversation and there was a teaching kind of moment. And then everyone kind of shared their feedback and, and their experiences. And it just so happened that the conversation or the topic that day was building a team. And so as the conversation began, it was very positive. You know, the the presenter was sharing some wonderful tips and some ideas, but then for the next hour, entrepreneur after entrepreneur went around the room and shared their challenges and their frustrations with their employees and with the people on their team. And as a result of this, we leave a little bit later, I call my friend and say, so, you know, what'd you think? He said, I've decided I'm going to sell my company. I don't want to have to deal with building out a team. And so it was from that moment on, that was really kind of a big pivot moment for me. It, It kind of dawned on me that there has to be something that 
people who build great teams, people who have great cultures, there has to be something that they're doing different than that group of entrepreneurs. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of successful entrepreneurs in that room, but they had to be doing something different. And so that began this new quest for me, so to speak. Well, that's, that's super interesting. I appreciate that background. And, and I agree. I mean, these, these are the passions that I also hold. Uh, I think it's just so important for us to always be thinking about effective leadership, to be thinking about our organizations, our cultures, uh, how we interact with our people. Uh, and, and sometimes we, we do that well. And other times we undermine ourselves usually inadvertently <laughs> um, that, you know, we end up hurting our own chances of, of having a dynamic team um, that's producing and innovating and doing really great things. Well, as, as we launch on into the conversation, I, I thought first you could share with listeners really your approach to leadership. Um, maybe three words that you would use to describe your leadership, your general approach and why. Sure. Three words would be tough. Um, I would say my simple answer would be that leadership is about serving. So that may be four words there, but um, it's about serving. And I think so often in, particularly in American culture, um, we are almost taught or we almost kind of witness from the outside that it's the opposite, that the further up we go in an organization, um, the more people will have under us to do all the things we don't want to do or to quote unquote serve us. And what I've discovered over time is that's, absolutely the the polar opposite is true, that the further up we go, the more responsibility we have and the fewer rights we have. So in other words, I'm, you know, quote unquote, the founder, the CEO of this company. Um, so I can, quote unquote, in, on, in theory, on paper, do whatever I want to do. But if I want to build a culture, a highly accountable, self-accountable culture, I can't do that, right? I have to be intentional about building this culture. Um, I would say that if you're unintentional about building a great culture, then you are intentionally building a bad culture. I think that's interesting. And, and it, it's a good reminder that culture will emerge when you have two or more people together, right? When, when you have people interacting, there will be a culture. Uh, and the question isn't, whether or not there will be a culture, it is what kind of a culture do you want to have? And will you allow for just anything to emerge that may be unhealthy, that may be unproductive, or are you going to be really proactive and strategic in shaping and honing and maintaining and uh, perpetuating a really psychologically safe, empowering, healthy culture that ultimately is going to help everyone thrive? Completely agree, Jonathan. What's interesting, if you look back at the the root word, the Latin word for culture, it actually shares the same as cultivate, right? So it's, it comes from the same root Latin word. And we think about cultivating the soul, what a farmer would do to cultivate the soul. It involves work. It involves being intentional. It involves breaking up what may be clay and, and other rough soil and kneading it and making it soft, supple soil so that it can take a seed so that the seed can then grow and flourish. And I think when we think about our culture and we think about our, our teams and the people that we lead, I think that we often pass culture over as kind of this um, ethereal, the super soft thing that one day we'll get to culture, right? One day when we have all the money that Google has, or when we have all the money that, you know, name the, the famous startup who's got the cool napping pods and all these other things, we'll get to culture then. Um, but the reality is all of those things that we often associate with culture. So our great culture, so the kitchen, the fully stocked kitchen, the, the napping pods, the you know, whatever all these things are, those things are actually not necessarily part of the culture. They're often a byproduct of what is intended when they're creating the culture. And I think we can fuse those things. And when we do that, we do ourselves, we do our teams a disservice. Yeah, I, I think that's wonderful. I, I love the, the connection back to the Latin root. I think that's awesome. Uh, a great reminder, I think, for all of us uh, as we consider the role of culture and how it connects with our own leadership styles, our own leadership approaches. Uh, maybe you can speak now specifically to some of the things you're doing within your organization to create that kind of a dynamic 
culture through your your leadership style, your your approach and your interactions with your people? Yeah, the first thing I'd say, Jonathan, is that all great leadership starts with the person in the mirror. The person that looks back at us in the mirror every single morning is always going to be the most difficult person we have to lead. Um, but that is where leadership begins. We must first learn to lead ourselves because if we want to have integrity in our leadership, if we want to have confidence in our leadership, we need to be able to learn to lead that person in the mirror. Um, the second part of that, I think, you know, that when we think about leadership, there, there's a few just kind of very tactical things or very practical things that help build a great positive culture. And one of those would be the difference between building trust and suspicion. Now, when I say that, most people are like, yeah, that's obvious. You know, we can build trust or we can build suspicion. But what's not obvious is that we have to have these conversations because just because people by default understand something, they don't necessarily translate that into their daily life. So let me give you a perfect example. When someone becomes a member of your team, there needs to be a conversation around building trust and, and suspicion. So every time you give your word or I give my word, there's a gap there. And in that gap is the ability to either build trust or suspicion. So Jonathan, if I come in every day to work, and let's say that one of our, our rules is we show up on time and we're prepared to work, and I'm supposed to be here at 8 o'clock, well, I roll in at 8.05, 8.10, 8.20, whatever time I want to, I have now created some suspicion, right? So our expectations say we show up on time and ready to work, but yet Wayne's actions aren't living up to that expectation. So I've created suspicion amongst my team that I don't hold those expectations to be that important because I'm violating them myself. And I think often as leaders, if we're not careful, we give ourselves a pass. We give ourselves a pass. We give ourselves the easy route because, and we're all susceptible to this, we judge ourselves based on our intentions, but others judge us based on our actions. I'll say that again because it's so important. We judge ourselves based on our intentions, but others always judge us based on our actions. So I may have great intentions of showing up on time, but a kid may have gotten sick or there may have been a, an accident on you know, the interstate on my way here, right? My intentions were to be here on time. I'm judging myself based on that intention. But when I walk into the office and everyone else is already working and it's 8.05, right? I've communicated something completely different. And so, you know, for me, leadership and, and building a culture begins with us. It begins again with that person that we look at in the mirror every day. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, the Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. I, I think that's exactly right. We, we definitely need to start with ourselves. And if, if we don't do the hard work of trying to understand our own inner workings and what drives us, what are, what motivates us and why, and learn how to deal with our own kind of stuff going on in our head, our baggage, um, uh, all the things rattling around up there. If we, if we don't do the self-reflective work and 
learn how to better manage and lead our own selves and our own lives, I don't know how we can hope to effectively lead other people. Uh, because so much, as you've already mentioned, so much of what leadership is, it's about creating uh, sustainable relationships. And that has to happen as you build mutual accountability and trust between individuals. And I I don't know how I build trust with people if I can't understand them and I can't fully understand them if I don't fully understand myself because I'm all, I'm always going to be projecting my own crap onto other people um, unless I can become more self-aware and, and understand my biases, understand, you know, my assumptions and how they're, how, how they end up influencing my perception you know, in, on the world around me and the people I interact with. So it starts with us. Um, it, it then has a direct impact on how we interact with those around us and, you know, people respond to us. So if, if I, if I approach an individual from a really kind of authoritarian um, command control, kind of an approach to leadership and I'm micromanaging and I kind of start from a place of distrust as opposed to, you know, starting to try to build trust. Uh, you know, if I'm that way with my people, they're going to respond in, in a kind of a corollary kind of a way. And it's usually not going to be something that's going to disrupt, you know, the, the, the style that I'm, I'm taking. That doesn't mean they're not capable of being in an adult environment where, you know, I, I, uh, have expectations for them. And then they, they achieve those expect, you know, they live up to those expectations and they, we develop trust over time. But if, if someone's being micromanaged, they're, they're going to end up uh, just uh, reverting back to kind of a like protective kind of an approach to their work. And, and ultimately it's going to reinforce my idea that maybe they're not someone that takes initiative or they're not someone who's willing to put themselves out there more. Uh, and it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it has to start with us first. Uh, and then that can lead to better long-term sustainable relationships with our people. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think when it comes to, you know, that trust or suspicion, I think that we all begin relationships, particularly on a team. We begin with the default of trust. We want to trust the people on our team. Um, you know, hopefully that we've had some decision or some ability to help sculpt that team, shape that team. Um, so we want to go into those relationships with trust. We begin with trust, but it's important to have that conversation around. I trust you. I trust that you're going to act in the best interest of the goals or, you know, whatever the objective that we're pursuing. Um, but here's some ways that you can build suspicion, right? Here's some actions. Here's some tangible things that you could do that would start building suspicion around this relationship. And I think it's so important that, that, you know, when we think about culture and when we think about leadership, communication is at the center of all of that, right? It's all about communication. And we get ourselves in trouble when we misinterpret or we misunderstand the difference between explicit communication and implicit communication or implied communication. All too often as leaders, I know I'm certainly guilty of this, we believe that we've explicitly explained something. In other words, this is what we're after. Here's the way we're going to pursue this thing, or here's the outcome that we're after. And come to find out a little bit later, we've really only implicitly explained all of the pieces and components are necessary. So one of the things that I often say is that if you find yourself frustrated, if you find yourself having to micromanage, chances are very good that you didn't explicitly communicate what was required. You know, I think by and large, most people, the vast majority of people want to show up every day and they want to do a good job. And so if something is not happening there, right? So they're not meeting those expectations. The first step is again, like, like we've already talked about to begin with us and say, okay, when furious, so I'm furious about the fact that things have gone off the tracks here. The results are not where we wanted them to be. When furious, get curious. Did I explain explicitly what we were after? Were they clear on the outcome that we were pursuing? And when you learn to analyze your communication through that lens, through the lens of explicit versus implicit, it removes a lot of that frustration. It removes this need to constantly micromanage because we've given them the outcome that we're after. We've set a very clear picture before them. 
And then we're able to remove ourselves to get out of the way and let them run towards that progress or towards that direction. Yeah, I, I love that approach and the the framing that you have there. I, I agree that ultimately, you know, our our role as a leader, uh, the number one thing we can do is to try to develop the people around us. Uh, once I'm in a leadership role, it's less about me being able to produce, me being able to, um, you know, achieve. You know, I'm not, I'm, as a leader, I'm not the one that's doing the work, right? Uh, as a leader, I'm the one that is overseeing and helping others do the work. I am the one that's hopefully leaning on the expertise of the team. Um, I might have areas of expertise. I might have come, you know, from a previous role where I was where they are now, and now I'm I, I oversee them. So I have some technical background to to assist in some ways. But largely, what the higher up you go in an organization, the less specific expertise and knowledge you have about all the areas that you oversee. Um, and so you have to lean on your people. You have to lean on what they bring to the table, and then you develop them. You empower them. You help them run with their projects, run with uh, what they're doing. And ultimately they're the ones that are going to produce. They're the ones that are going to make you look good or make you not look good. And that largely is going to be determined on how you interact with them and how you build, um, you know, relationships of trust and uh, mutual uh, expectations and accountability culture uh, and psychological safety and all of those different elements. Ultimately that's going to drive what's going to happen with your team. And so when I look at organizations, I look at teams that are not effective. Um, you know, sometimes there is, you know, an individual on the team that's problematic. Uh, and, and so the leader has to go through the work of performance management and, and discipline. And sometimes you got to get rid of someone or, you know, br- you know, reconfigure the team that does happen. But most of the dysfunction that we see in teams I would say is not the quote unquote fault of individual team members. It's, it's the fault of the leader. Cause that's their job that at me as a leader, uh, my job is to help people work together well. And you're going to have people with different backgrounds, different personalities, different worldviews. Uh, my job is to help bridge the gaps that might exist between those individuals to help them learn how to communicate with each other, to understand each other, to trust each other, to work well together. And and then they can accomplish some really great things. Yeah. I love all that. And it goes back to kind of creating that soul, right? Cultivating the soul so that it becomes, it's fertile ground for a great culture. It's fertile ground for people to sprout, for people to grow, um, for people to become leaders themselves. And one of the things that I love to, to talk about and think about as it relates to leadership is this, you know, everyone loves the idea or the notion of being a leader or talking about leadership principles and, and ideas. But in order to be a leader, by default, there has to be a follower, right? I think it was John Maxwell who said that if you think you're leading, but no one's following, you're just going for a walk. And, you know, when we think about following, A great place to start in terms of analyzing your own leadership is to say, who are some people that I love to follow? And I don't mean that like on social media, although you can follow people on social media. What I mean by that is, who is someone that you look up to, someone that you respect in such a way that you either A, currently follow them, or B, you would be willing to follow that person. And then take just a few minutes and list out what are the attributes, what are the characteristics that make this person such a great leader, such a great person that I'm willing to follow them. And that is often a very good litmus test to begin and to kind of analyze our own leadership. Look at those that we respect in leadership positions. What is it about them that we admire? What is it about them we respect? And what are the reasons we are willing to follow them? And then we can, we can take those same things and flip those and begin implementing, working on those things in our own lives. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Wayne. It has just been a real pleasure talking with you and just picking your brain a little bit and and hearing all of your wonderful insights in relation to leadership and culture. 
I, I want to be respectful of your time. I notice we're getting close to the end of our time together. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about uh, your organization, the work that you're doing, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure, absolutely, Jonathan. Um, so the easiest place for people to, to find me is just on our website. It's just uglymugmarketing.com. Um, all of our social channels, my email address, phone numbers, all that they can find right there on the website. Um, and as it comes to leadership, um, kind of a parting thought on leadership and culture would just simply be this, that, you know, it's the little things that over time make the big difference. And to put it more succinctly, it's this consistency creates miracles. Consistency creates miracles. Um, so it, it's not about you know, I think too often in life, we, we look at great leaders and we think that there was this magical transformation that they went from average Joe or average Jane to amazing leader, you know, in kind of a, a short window or a short period. And the reality is if we step back and really look and we hear their stories, what we'll discover is, is they took very consistent actions day in and day out to hone and to build their leadership skills. And, and the same is true with culture. It's not like some magic wand you can wave and all of a sudden you've got a great culture. It's in the consistency. It's the consistency that creates the miracles. I love it. The consistency that creates the miracles. Absolutely. We have it. You know, if you're going to develop trust, you, you got to be consistent. You get people have to know that they can count on you, that your word means something, that you're going to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Um, I think at its very most fundamental foundational level, leadership, as you have followers, as you mentioned, leadership is about uh, relationships and relationships are about trust. Uh, and if we want a dynamic culture, we ultimately need to uh, to genuinely care about our people, develop those relationships, develop them and create trusting, mutually accountable relationships with them in the workplace. Well, Wayne, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected with Wayne, find out more about what he and his company can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.